Hello and welcome to Indus Special. I'm Michelle Malik. Unemployment continues to exist as a global crisis, and with further technological advancements, many people fear the rise of job cuts. The international labor forecasts that youth unemployment will also continue to rise, where young people will find it much harder to find jobs than adults. So it's no surprise that many people around the world are now looking towards other options, causing the subsequent rise in the global gig economy and also in self-employment. On tonight's show, we discuss if self-employment is indeed the future and how practically viable it is. Joining us for this discussion today, Mr. St Steve Keen, who is an economist, joining us from Amsterdam. We're also joined in the studios uh, by Mr. Usman Pervez Mughal, who is an entrepreneur. Thank you both for joining us. Mr. Steve, let me start off with you. Tell us the global state of self-employment and what is causing the attraction towards it. Well, self-employment self is actually rather a euphemistic term. There are some people who are quite comfortably self-employed. I count myself as one of those. But there's a large number of people who used to have uh, full-time jobs as workers in various companies. And those companies decided to outsource their operations. And frequently that involved the uh, previous employees being sacked, uh, then told they're going to be rehired as contract as contractors, independent contractors, yeah. responsible for their own costs and so on. And so basically they ended up carrying all the uh, instability and all the uncertainty of the business was dumped on them because if the business was doing well that week, they'd get 60 hours work and it was doing badly, they'd get six or zero. So I think we have to uh, differentiate one type from the other before we talk about the phenomenon. Yeah, and Mr. Steve, just building on to that, tell us a little about why uh, these firms, these multinationals would rather outsource than hire people on a permanent basis. What are the advantages of outsourcing in this regard? Well, a lot of very negative ones, uh, good, good for the firm to some extent, often bad for them in the long run. And that is that, first of all, they can dispense with paying workers' compensation, they can dispense with insurance, health, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, particularly in the American corporate environment, which even Paul Samuelson described as being uh, a, a power, overpowering capitalist and a coward workforce. Yeah. And that's from a, you know, a conservative economist. Um, that, that's, they quite enjoyed doing that. Uh, also, a lot of the outsourcing, of course, was to take advantage of lower wages in third world countries. Yeah. So uh, that was also so those things uh, I, I think are quite negative uh, for the majority of people. So uh, because most people have the capital, have their own business. Yeah. So, Mr. Steve, something that I'm going to quote, which was quoted in the Guardian, was by Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the uh, Britain's Labour Party, who says that uh, freelancing and the gig economy is enabling a more rapturous and exploitative form of capitalism. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, oh, I agree. And I'll give one of my favorite examples of that. I was speaking at a conference in Florida about 15 years ago uh, with a whole bunch of people from developing countries as well as myself, and they were objecting to paying tips. And I explained that if they didn't pay tips, the waiters and waitresses at this restaurant would be living on starvation wages. And one of them came over and said, I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. Uh, and said, the, we get paid $3 per hour, roughly, to wait tables. Now, the, the minimum cost of living in America are 10 to 15. So if they didn't get tips, they'd starve. Now, what was happening in that restaurant, of course, if it was a bad night, it was the workers who suffered. The boss had paid three dollars an hour rather than paying fifteen. So it transfers the risk from the work from the capitalists to the workers, and that's not to me what capitalism should be about. Yeah, all right. So, Mr. Steve, just on that point, but I also want to bring in Mr. Sman into this conversation, who's an entrepreneur, and I want to ask from your experience of freelancing and starting your own uh, business, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Michelle, for having me here. Um, well, yeah, the question is really interesting that you guys are, are talking about. Um, in Pakistan, obviously, uh, we see um, a lot of people are being um, educated in different schools and universities. But then again, after graduating, they don't know what to do. Because we have a lot of graduates, but we yeah. don't have a lot of companies where they can start uh, their jobs or, you know. And even if they start doing uh, jobs at different companies, they don't um, get enough salaries where mm. they can um, you know, um, use it for uh, using their expenses, for running their families. If you just look at the fuel prices, the prices for getting eggs and bread for your house, 
um, it doesn't, you know, fulfill every need that in, that's in the family. Yeah. So obviously after that, if they're not getting proper jobs, they start doing uh, something else or maybe to doing two jobs at yeah. the same time, which is more hectic. Yeah. And you mentioned here students who have just recently graduated mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, estimates show that, for example, receiving a graduate degree would cost anywhere around $30,000 to $120,000. And True. this is an average cost. So that's a very substantial investment right there. After Thank that, you. not finding a job. Do you think that's why many students decide that it's better not to rely on the market, but to create their own uh, form of a business or their own venture? Well, the trend has changed because uh, if we see like in the last five, 10 years, people have started doing something, their startups, even before graduating. They do uh, give their interest in this because they think uh, instead of going and working for someone, it's better to start up their own thing, yeah. which is good, which is happening now. Yeah. And Mr. Steve, uh, bringing you back into this conversation, when we're talking about young people moving towards the idea of self-employment or freelancing or uh, starting up their own business ventures, do you think it's also because there is a shift in the perceptions of how work should be in the work balance, uh, in the work life balance and how uh, corporate culture is to be and more and more people are becoming disillusioned by that. Well, I think it's a disillusion by both. I mean, I'm lucky to be outside both those situations right now. Uh, but I know a lot of young people who are uh, having to do three to six months uh, work for free for companies, what they call internship, uh, before they've even got a chance to apply for jobs elsewhere. Uh, and then when they, if they don't get a job, they find themselves working in what uh, is called the gig economy, where they might have three or four different jobs and able to make, make ends meet. Now, yeah. of course, there is a minority that make a very good business out of all this, uh, but we, 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 we tend to eulogize the minority and ignore the majority situation. And I think that majority situation is a, a lot behind things like the Gilets Jaunes protest in France and the, the, the level of rebellion that's actually arising about capitalism in the West right now, which is a, a very new phenomenon. Yeah. And tell us more, Steve, about this gig economy. Just let's explore that. What is it exactly? What are the options out there? And what is the attraction towards it? Well, well, it's a glamorous way of describing having to work at multiple jobs to make enough money to stay alive. Uh, I know people who work in two or three restaurants at different times of the day. Uh, they can get shifts at one, they can't get shifts at another. Uh, they might work as a courier at another time apart from that. They could do babysitting jobs. Now, yeah. it, it sounds like you're multitasking and not stuck in one particular rut, and of course, there is that element to it. But often it's you're just not, not being paid enough in any of those to, buy, to make ends meet, so you've got to do more than one job. You end up, rather than having a work-life balance, you end up working 40 to 60 hours a week, and you spend fair, but what should be family time, you're spending commuting from one position to another. So yeah. I think it's been massively over overhyped. Yeah. And I think that's different from starting your own businesses. How is it exactly different? Oh, it's completely. When you start your own business, you have a venture in mind. Uh, for example, my, my work, of course, I'm a non-orthodox econom economist and I support myself through Patreon. And uh, I've only been able to do that because I've already built up a large reputation. Now, if you're starting out as a, as a young person, then to start your own business, you have to have a business plan. plan. Yeah. Some proposal you think is going to work commercially. Uh, that's difficult if you don't have initial capital, uh, but it can be done. And of course, the areas like uh, computer software, music, uh, you know, those sorts of areas give you a chance to start with nothing more than a, you know, a, a, a programming sheet or a guitar. And uh, so that end of the gig economy does function. And you do get people becoming you know, very wealthy out of it. Uh, but again, I think that's the minority. That's, yeah. that's the 5% to the 95%. So when we're talking about this being the minority, of course, you mentioned that there are several factors as to why not everyone can pursue this uh, path. But let's talk to Usman about his experience. And when you started your own uh, business, what were some of the factors you took into consideration? What were some of the risks you had to deal with? Michal, starting your own thing in Pakistan or in Lahore, especially the city, because there are main three cities, Islamabad, uh, Lahore and Karachi, if you have to start your own thing, you have to take a lot of risk. And obviously, as you've studied in uh, our business studies, that high risk brings high return, but it can also bring high loss as well. Yeah. So obviously, taking a risk over here and talking it to your family uh, of doing something like that is always, you know, tricky. 
because uh, they can be supportive and they cannot be supportive at all. So it is a high risk. But when I started around eight, nine years back, I was all alone. And while I was starting my own business, I did not leave my job. I, mm. I, I kept my job and I was doing my job and my business for one year. So I was doing two different things. So you had a safety net. Yeah, I had to. I had to do. I had to keep my job at one side and was doing so I was uh, working at my job on the weekdays and on weekends I was doing my business yeah so that's why I would, so I was working seven days a week yeah for 365 days and after a year I realized that I was at a point where I could see the business growing yeah and then I left my job but what kept you going in that regard what was the main driving force because you're telling us that you were working relentlessly yeah. there yeah, yeah but yeah. what was driving you well i think it's your dedication that you put in your passion and, and you should have a broader vision and obviously you know there's someone in the family that uh, it was my mom uh, who was always at my back not my dad but my mom <laughs> she always supported me yeah but you know it's your dedication that you put in in your passion so you can achieve the vision that you're looking at yeah uh, and Mr. Steve, there was a very interesting article in the Wall Street Journal that talked about how uh, the new generation, especially Generation Z, would rather uh, wants greater promotions much faster. People, young people employed would expect a promotion in just six months. Keeping with that and all that we uh, hear about millennials and the new generation, do you think this is more befitting for them to find a healthy work environment to start something in their own if corporations would not facilitate what their expectations are? Well, the, well, their expectations are going to be dashed most of the time. A minority, again, will get that quickly up. And if you got promoted every six months, you'd be running you'd be running IBM by the time you're 30. That doesn't happen to everybody. So there's always this mishmash between yeah. expectations and reality. Uh, yeah. in that, I think for a lot of people, the, the corporate culture is as the, the corporate culture did provide security once, you don't get that same sense of community anymore more inside modern corporations. So there is that temptation to have more of a personal uh, control over your lifestyle by yep. being self-employed. But again, as I say, that comes with bigger costs than the old days where even in my father's case, um, he, he knew everybody at work, everybody knew him. It was a, a 35 year, an hour, uh, 35 to 40 hour a job every day to the day he retired. And uh, that, with, with that, that without a sense of community can yeah. be slave for a lot of people. So it is a difficult balance. Yeah, it definitely uh, seems to be that way. Uh, hold on to that, Mr. Steve. We're also joined by Muhammad Khan, who's a YouTuber joining us from Lahore. Thank you so much, Muhammad, for joining us. So the conversation we are having right now is young people aspiring towards creating something of their own, setting up a business, freelancing. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see that as a positive uh, step in the right direction? Or do you see that as hindering uh, a person's uh, hindering a person from achieving greater job security and reliance on a proper structure. Um, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me, Michal, and thank you for the, for the opportunity to speak again. Um, the question you ask is a dangerous one because, um, uh, of course, you want people, uh, right out, out of the bat, of course, you would want people who have the entrepreneurial spirit to exercise that spirit. You want enterprising individuals coming out and creating jobs yeah. not only creating jobs but only actually doing the work that they need to do to help the economy and help themselves and be better people so that's definitely there but the problem uh, nowadays that i see especially in universities because i've been around the block in terms of you know giving lectures in universities helping people start their small businesses start their small enterprises so i get to talk to people and my youtube channel is based around helping people convert their hobbies and ideas into an online business into a business a stable business so the problem that i see is that a lot of people think that this is a side thing a side hustle something that they can do in their spare time uh, and that's the that is the uh, one of the biggest problems that i see otherwise what do you mean by that a side hustle there their primary their primary focus is a, a, a full-time job uh, no um, when i say side hustle is that when they want to start their own business they should treat it as their own business and they should treat it like a proper 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 work 
it shouldn't be that they do work on the side and then they just waste their day doing whatever they want to do and stuff like that. They should treat it professionally. So, Muhammad, they you're talking about they yeah. show up the time. You're talking about discipline here and work ethic. So, tell us something yeah, yeah. from your observations and what advice you would impart on people who are young and just starting out. What are the key things they need to keep in mind? Uh, um, uh, I'm. I don't consider myself uh, worthy of giving advice in that sense. I'm only someone who's a student and who is who is uh, who's still a student. Uh, so, from your experience, what of, works? Um, uh, yeah, I can only share what has worked for me and the path that I've walked. And anyone, if anyone else wants to walk that path, um, the thing that really helps, and because I'm a student of psychology uh, as well, what really helps is the conscientiousness. It's a proper personality trait, and what that translates into is that the more discipline you have, the more grit you have of not giving up and showing up day in, day out. Basically, not giving up. Yeah. And, you know, adjusting your, basically showing up for work every day. Being you will, consistent. inshallah, find a way of making it work. Yeah, consistency is, is the biggest killer of dreams. And uh, uh, inconsistency is the biggest killer of dreams. And what we need to do is show up at the doorstep of our dreams daily. Yeah. I and, think yeah. And so ask Usman his opinion on this as well. You've heard what Muhammad had to say. Do you agree with it? Do you have anything to add to it? Not really, but he, he's actually right. Consistency mat matters a lot. You gotta be very consistent in whatever you're doing. You gotta have put your dedication into your dreams. You know, if you really wanna, wanna, wanna make your dreams come true, you have to go you have to go follow them. Yeah. You have to go follow them, so pursue them so that you can fulfill them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Mr. Steve, when we talk about the capitalist system, of course, we always uh, bring to mind the alienation that workers experience when they are working highly specialized jobs. Do you think that that is something that can, I know you've reiterated that this is the minority case for most people who venture out into their own freelancing and businesses. But do you think that does provide a greater opportunity to find a solution to that alienation? Well, it's, a, it's certainly being uh, self-employed gets you away from having to uh, you know, be you know, channeled into a particular style of behavior every, every uh, nine to five every day. So yes, that is an attraction. And uh, I, I think that's, uh, there are people who've got what you might call an entrepreneurial, per, entrepreneurial personality. They simply don't fit into an organization where they're given orders all the time. So that gives a strong motivation to go out and work on your own. In my own family of five, I think I could describe all five, possibly just four out of the five as entrepreneurial. And uh, we don't work well for bosses. Yeah. Uh, we work well, uh, nonetheless. So that is a motivation for the top top five percent. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Steve, to take the conversation into the political realm, we're hearing about India's uh, upcoming elections and we hear how a key issue will be the employment, job opportunities for young people, something that was not created. So in economies such as this, where the government is failing to create enough jobs, and don't you think this becomes the only viable alternative? Well, if you're unemployed, yes, particularly if there are no social security benefits or like in the West, they've, got been, they've been pushed down to the stage where they're miserable. Uh, one of the advantages of India, I expect, is that there isn't quite the same level of monitoring of people who are unemployed, so you can get away with it without getting your un unemployment benefits cut, yeah. which unfortunately is what happens in the West. So there's probably more chance to be entrepreneurial if you find yourself in that situation in a developing country than there is in the West these days. Yeah. And if in an economy there is a failure of the government to create enough jobs, what do you think they can do, policymakers can do to facilitate those who want to start their own ventures? Well, it's a combination of things there. I mean, the, it isn't just the government to create jobs. It's the capitalist economy in general that should be creating them. Uh, there, there will be a shortfall. There's always unemployment. And uh, if you get that systemic level of unemployment, the government can actually create additional demand by creating additional money uh, yeah. using what's called the, the modern monetary theory approach. The government should be doing that uh, where the government can get away with it, which means it has to be printing its own currency and, in my opinion, has to be running a trade surplus. Um, that gives it a capacity to boost the level of demand in the economy. Uh, but apart from that, I think there's a very difficult phase coming forward because we may talk about this in more detail later. But I think we're transiting to a world in which you don't particularly need labour to produce a large number of goods. Yeah. And in that situation, there will be mass unemployment. And I don't think there's anything we can do about that. Yeah. 
And I take your point there and we will get back to it. But before that, I just like to talk to Muhammad about YouTube a little. And Muhammad, a lot of people are interested in how they can monetize their YouTube videos and their YouTube content. Could you just give us a brief overview of it? Uh, of course, a, a lot of interest uh, in uh, monetizing using YouTube and how, how that works. Um, of course, it's possible. A lot of people are getting into it, especially uh, uh, there are two different, uh, two main categories here. People who are creating content for the international audience and people who are creating content for the Pakistani audience. Both are making money. Of course, people who are catering and are successfully catering to the international audience are making a lot more money than people who are catering specifically to the Pakistani audience. Uh, having said that, what usually people mean by when they say that uh, they are uh, doing YouTube is that they are creating content and generating money by ads. That is just one out of six different ways that you can earn money using videos using YouTube. So uh, my, my main push has been to help people set up those other uh, channels of income uh, uh, as well. And that yeah. includes, for example, my primary source of income is not via YouTube ad money. That is via selling services, via selling consultancy that I get exposure for using YouTube videos. So it, it has to be part of a bigger plan, part of a bigger business plan. And if you if you if one manages to do that, then YouTube definitely plays a much bigger part than just ads. And I'm saying just ads in jest because you know, a lot of people are making good money, thousand, ten thousand, five thousand, six thousand dollars a month. I know people who are doing that, and of course, a lot of people are earning a lot more than that, and some are earning less than that. Yeah, it requires hard work. It varies. Work. It's not, yeah, it's not easy, uh, yeah. but it's definitely doable. And if you think you can do it, you can pull it off. You should definitely give it a shot. Yeah, and uh, thank for that overview, uh, um, uh, Muhammad stay with us but uh usman something that muhammad was talking about here was a uh, youtube channel and how to monetize it and mm -hmm. we are seeing in this world when there are an influx of people who want to try out the same thing it's very important to create a brand for yourself tell us how important is branding and how did you create a brand for yourself and your business well obviously as muhammad said you about youtube i think youtube facebook instagram twitter Everything that is uh, related to social media right now is important and plays a major role. Um, but about the people who wants to get famous right away on YouTube, obviously that's not going to happen. Yeah. Because people put a lot of effort and they put a lot of good content on YouTube. The, being a YouTuber, there, there are so many YouTubers now because the trend was changing in the last 10 years. It went from everybody went on Facebook. Yeah. And then everybody went from Facebook to Instagram. And when we're talking about content and the quality mm. of content, let's uh, uh, dwell deeper into that. How important is to mark the quality of your content and make sure that it is unique in order for it to sell? Well, quality always matters. It, it, it matters in everything, even in your videos or in something in writing. You know, it always matters. Yeah. So if you're just making videos and putting a lot of videos on YouTube and, you, and it doesn't have any sense, doesn't have any topic, doesn't have any conclusion, it's not going to matter, people are not going to see it. Yeah. And obviously, earning money through YouTube is not through the ads. That's just like this amount. Yeah. Um, if you're working for a brand and making a video, a review video for them, then that's how you make money on YouTube. And with YouTube. photography here, what do yeah. people like? What do they enjoy? What sells? Well, I think we've been doing uh, photography for now the last eight, nine years. And what we've done is we've tried to so when I started doing it, the, there was this regular way of doing and covering weddings hmm. where you ask the couple not to smile and to, you know, how it was, right? So we, we tried to introduce the new thing where we... Couple um, smile? Yeah, the, the, the couple are smiling, people... And, they look you know, happy talk, on their wedding day. Yeah, you, obviously they're going to cry on the Barat day, but you have to make them smile and maybe they, you can get a good shot, some candid shots. So that's how it, it started coming in because people... Uh, like the candid photos. So if you had to describe your brand, your company in one word, how would you describe it? <laughs> well, the, I think the, um, it's going to be hard for me right now to say just one word. But I think the reason why people come to us is because um, when they come to us for the booking and everything, they get really comfortable with us. Yeah. Because getting for the couple to get comfortable with their own photographer is really, really important. 
Because if they're not comfortable with the photographers, they're not going to be comfortable in front of the camera. Yeah. If they're not comfortable in front of the camera, we're not going to get good photos. So, Usman, just before we uh, go for a short break, tell us how important is good customer service when you are starting out uh, a, n a new business and even when you want to continue your business? Usually, customer service is good for every business when they start up. But as they expand, customer service level goes down. I'm, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure everybody um, in this room uh, have experienced that because you'll be you dealing with some big company when they've expanded, customer service level goes down. Yeah. So we have to make sure that the customer service and, you know, if obviously you do get complaints from ev in every business, you get complaints from clients. You should be able to overcome, overcome them and you should be able to resolve them. Yeah. So the customer service is always, always very important. Very important. Yeah. yeah, it's good that you stressed on that. And with that, we're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us. Welcome back to In The Special. While we continue our discussion, we are now joined by Mr. Zain Ashraf Mughal, who is an entrepreneur and who was also featured in Forbes uh, 30 Under 30. Thank you so much, Mr. Zain, for joining us. Zain, we were talking about options for young people to move towards and create their own business ventures. And since that is something you deal with very, very closely, tell us the options that are available for people who are short on capital and uh, do not have enough investment to start their own business. Thank you very much, Michelle, for having me. I think there's a huge opportunity in Pakistan. I believe that if you're an underdeveloped or developing country, uh, there's a much more vacuum than any developed countries around the world because uh, there's so much opportunity that is lying and there's so much untapped market. Uh, I would say that Pakistan is obviously 60% of the population is youth, yeah. uh, which means that 60% is under 30. So anyone who wants to start a business, it doesn't have to be the perfect idea. Uh, I believe that, you know, the moment, uh, if you know how to delegate things as, as soon as you have the opportunity to delegate something to someone else, that you can focus on the next thing. I think uh, mostly what happens is that, you know, in Pakistan, we want to do everything ourselves. Uh, it's very, very important that, you know, your ideas, uh, even if it's a similar idea that is already being done uh, previously, but, you know, you have to execute in a way that uh, uh, it, it really matters. If you have done, if you have executed your idea, uh, well, that really matters. Uh, and obviously... Zen, could you give us an example of that? Yeah. So basically, I, I believe that, you know, uh, let's take an example of Kareem. Uh, so Uber already existed in the world. So Kareem came in Pakistan. It, it was not a very novel idea. But then again, uh, Kareem had the opportunity of being in Pakistan, play with the local market and executed well. And, you know, they saw the opportunity. And and when, you know, Uber saw that a big, as a threat or a competitor, they bought it out. So there's so many opportunity lying in Pakistan at the moment. You All we have to do is we can even... Uh, you know, do a similar idea that is being uh, done either in Europe or America. Uh, but you have to uh, make sure that, you know, you're capturing the right market the right way. Yeah. And so we don't have to get married to the outcome. So basically, I would say, you know, uh, we all think that, you know, when are we going to get the gratification out of the work? So we have to just get to work because the, you can never guarantee the outcome of anything you do. There's so many factors involved that can apply to hiring, launching a new idea, advertising, raising money and more. And if you go with the right mindset and stay flexible, any pivots are just great learning experiences and opportunities yeah. to improve. And there are no real failures. You just keep growing and getting better. So I would say to the youth, just get to work and make the best decision you can with the data you have and the best advice you can get. And then that's a very positive uh, message to send out. But can you tell us what your company does in order to help businesses in starting up? And can you tell us exactly how microfinance works and what are the options for people who are short on capital while beginning right. their businesses? So basically, so basically uh, I'm into microfinance uh, sector since 2013. Uh, I'm running an organization for all these people who are living below poverty line. These are the people who cannot earn over $2 a day, right? Uh, 
uh, what we do is we thought that, you know, the best way to help these people would be to connect the donors from all around the globe with the potential micro entrepreneurs in Pakistan. Uh, so we How do you connect the uh, donors from yes, all over the yes. world? So, so we built Pakistan's first crowdfunding platform, which is working to alleviate poverty in Pakistan by establishing micro entrepreneurs uh, through interest free microfinancing. Anybody uh, who wants to start a business ranging from 50,000 rupees up to 200,000 rupees, these are small businesses. Like either you want to start a new business or you want to sustain a business or you want to expand. Uh, something yeah. you're already doing, uh, be it be a rickshaw, be a utility store, saving center, street hawker, uh, anything you want to do. And who right? do you? How do you select those who you will uh, want to give loans to? So basically, uh, Michelle, uh, these people come to our branches. Uh, uh, we have so many, th we have thousands of applications coming in, and obviously. Uh, uh, we have limited resources to help these people, but we have a very robust verification portal. Uh, CDAOs is is 100% paperless organization, and we have a very uh, stringent seven-level verification backend portal, which verifies the the genuineness of the potential entrepreneur. Because when we take the application, it go it goes through our desk officer, then the credit officer visits the person, uh, do the social economic evaluation, ensures that you know. Uh, all the story he's telling is valid or not. Yeah. Uh, see whether his kids goes to school or not. You know, the, his dependence on him. And yeah. then, then the application moves on to the credit manager, then social mobilizer, then right. content writer, then CFO, country. So the seven levels are, verifies one individual uh, who's a potential entrepreneur. So once his application right. is verified, it gets published on the crowdfunding platform that we have, which is cda.org. Yeah, and it uh, seems... We get that. Yeah, yeah, and Zen, it seems like the system you have there is very thorough. But something that you mentioned was crowdfunding, and I want uh, uh, Mr. Steve, uh, Mr. Steve's perspective on this. How can crowdfunding, from a global perspective, be used as uh, Zen's model uses it for starting out businesses? What is the potential there? I think it's quite it's quite high because for example, I, I got involved in crowdfunding now to keep on doing my work on critiquing. Uh, conventional economics and developing new economics outside the university sector through Patreon. And one major reason for that was, in fact, YouTube pays very poorly uh, for anybody who doesn't get a mega hit where they get 10 million downloads of their cat video or their late, latest um, rap. So um, Patreon is now growing as a venue where you can advertise that you're doing something in a specific market segment and then get people to support you on a monthly basis. And it, it does give you a platform uh, to reach a global audience. So I think that is a, a new trend, largely because the existing institutions, Google, Facebook, um, YouTube as well, fail to provide a way to really commercialize unless you're outrageously successful. Um, Patreon is bridging that gap. Yeah. And my voice dying, by the way. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. Mr. Steve, so something that you also meant earlier was the inevitable rise of techno uh, technology, which will lead to job loss and something that we have to anticipate. But what are the solutions to that? And we hear this argument coming a lot when we talk about artificial intelligence, let's say. And uh, once that comes into place, many people will lose their jobs. How are economists, how are governments going to deal with that? Are there any game plans in place? Well, I think there are, there are two basic proposals forward. And one is what's called a job guarantee. And the idea would be that you uh, would have come, the government would guarantee that anybody who became unemployed in the private sector would have a job at a minimum wage, but a livable wage, uh, provided by the government sector until such time as private sector employment picked up again. And... Uh, the other proposal is to have what they call the universal basic income. Mm -hmm. So whether you work or not, you'd be paid a sufficient amount to live. And then to get better than that, you'd need to get a job in a company or you'd need to start your own company. Uh, I'm, I'm not in, I'm, I'm, there are people who are very passionate about one or the other. I think that ultimately the, the universal basic income is the way we're going to have to go because so many... But the experiment that took place with universal basic income showed that might not have the best results. Oh, how it's been, it's been done at the moment has been a way of avoiding welfare payments by the state. Uh, the UK government has brought in what they call... Uh, I've forgotten its name, but it means like, like universal basic, wa basic wage. It's dreadful. 
It's a punitive system. It's designed mm -hmm. to punish anybody who's unemployed. And uh, the Australian government has done a similar thing. So there are very, very bad uh, implementations of it, which come from a philosophy that says that if you're out of work, it's your fault. Um, that, that philosophy, I think, has to fail in the long term. And if we don't provide a way of giving people income, uh, independent of whether they're working or whether they own their own business, yeah. we're going to face a future like the Hunger Games. Yeah. And uh, with that, I want to uh, ask you, Mohammed, what patterns and shifts are you seeing, especially in tech and uh, internet platforms, social media platforms that, sig uh, that give you a signal that unemployment in these sectors will rise in the future, if there are any? No, I don't think the unemployment um, uh, will... Uh, I'm not an expert in uh, unemployment or unemployment, but I think the opportunities, if, if you want to wanna map employment to opportunities, the opportunities are not even... Uh, we haven't seen the tip... It's just the tip of the iceberg. All the opportunities that are present right now, yeah. uh, I think uh, it, will, it will explode in the next 10 years because... What we have to realize is that right now, um, more than 50% of the world population has yet to access the internet. And once those kind of technologies uh, are available to the masses, like en masse, like all six billion plus people yeah. um, are online, that, that's a different, different internet than what it is now. And right yeah. now, even we don't understand the scale of this. So, but but so right, it's, it's opportunities out. Yeah, but, but Mohammed, in relation to all the algorithms we are seeing, for example, uh, in relation to advertisement, don't you think that many people who are employed in marketing will become obsolete or they will lose their jobs with the more sophisticated algorithms that come into place? That is, I totally agree with you, uh, Michal, over there, that um, yes, as the algorithms will become more sophisticated, and this is a classic debate, right? And um, uh, as, as the technology becomes more sophisticated, um, more and more people who have more and more mechanical jobs, uh, mm. re uh, 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 repeating jobs, process-based jobs, they will, they will be out of a job. Yeah. And uh, uh, more human, more creative-based jobs will be uh, in order. And um, this is already happening, for example, as a big an industry as uh, truck, trucking. Trucking in America is actually under threat because of the automated trucks that uh, the big guns are coming up with. And uh, so, yeah, even in, in such a such a big industry like trucks. So, yes, I totally agree with you that your skill as a human uh, will be tested and um, it won't be easy, but it, uh, it's a shift that is happening and will happen. And we'll have to adjust and enhance our creative creative muscles more than normal. That's for sure. I agree with that. Yeah. And uh, I want to ask uh, Zen something. Zen, you've traveled the world. You've seen the global landscape. And especially when it comes to youth unemployment, what is the state you are observing right now globally? Yeah. I think the, the world is for the youth right now. There's so much opportunity out there. Uh, but before I come in, I would also like to add one point. Uh, you were asking about AI technology. Yeah. I think that AI technology is not going to replace humans. I think AI is going to free us from the repetitive tasks that humans are doing. Uh, for example, it is going to help us in data crunching rather than doing uh, creative jobs that humans are doing. They're not, AI is not uh, very smart enough yet to replace humans to do something different. Uh, basically, we have to, uh, you know, uh, we have to shorten the time that humans are taking on doing some jobs. So AI allows us to yeah. better at our jobs by making us more humans than replacing us, I would say. Um, and then, you know, AI also, if, if, if AI is a huge industry. And, if, you know, uh, if it comes in Pakistan, I think uh, around the globe, too, it's going to create a lot of new industries and jobs. In fact, it's going to create new jobs uh, rather than replace the jobs because it's a whole lot of new industry that we have just uh, conquered and uh, I think it's, there's a lot of exploration needs to be done in this industry. Uh, and, yeah. and obviously, uh, if you talk yeah. about health... Zen, Zen I'm going to uh, hold on to that thought. I also want to introduce another guest who's joined us, uh, Dr. Salman Shah, who is an economist. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salman Shah, for joining us. We were talking earlier about how uh, with unemployment rising, the gig economy is exploding. And reports show that in countries such as the United States, by 2027, 50 
percent of the people will be engaged in this. How do you see this for the economy? What do you see the benefits of freelancing, and what do you see uh, the negatives of it for the globe uh, for the economy? Well, I think the <clears throat> most important thing for us is that we have a huge youth bulge. Almost sixty uh, percent of our population is under the age of twenty-five. And we have a very large population. So if you are looking at 220 million people, which are almost fifth largest country in the world, and of those, almost 60% are under 25 years of age. So we have a really a very big youth bulge. And from this youth bulge, we would have at least 5% or 10% of people who can be really very, very intelligent and uh, innovative uh, if they have access to this kind of technology and information and uh, through this technology they could access the world markets. So yeah. I think this would really give our youth uh, a very important highway into access to the entire world. So from that perspective, I think this is going to be uh, uh, very good for Pakistan. And there are lots and lots of young people who are very talented uh, and who can create uh, 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 an impact in this industry. So uh, actually, this uh, does not depend upon the level of industrialization of a country or the level of Dr. Uh, uh, Salman, just uh, one uh, last question to you. When we're talking about uh, uh, the young population who there's a youth bulge and people are moving towards different opportunities and we see governments all over the world not being able to create enough jobs, how do you think governments can facilitate these young people in moving towards uh, business ventures and creating their own business ventures? What are some of the, the practical ways to help them? Yeah, I think the government can do a lot because there are lots of government uh, operations and entities and services uh, which these people can really make them uh, super efficient and uh, they can make these things much better. They can help the government induct a new way of doing business. And yeah. uh, so the these guys will have an opportunity within the country and then they can leverage on that opportunity and go out into the wider yeah, world. Right. Uh, the point is that we have a very big youth bulge, a huge uh, youth potential and access to uh, uh, actually uh, and have been able to get a global reach and maybe the government as a stepping stone provides them with that facility. Yeah. Uh, to uh, to actually Doc, test their yeah, products right. and their output within the country and from there they can leverage outside. Yeah. So I think that and this is a really good fit for, uh, for a yeah, country like Pakistan. Yes, right. And Dr. Salman, your point there, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about this. Uh, Mr. Steve, uh, going back to how we're seeing uh, people engaging in self-employment, uh, there were reports uh, put out that UK, a significant amount of young people are engaging in self-employment, but also people above the age of 65 are as well. So here, what do you think is happening? Do you think people that uh, would rather retire after a certain age are now seeking uh, other employment opportunities? Um, I'm again in the lucky situation where I'm well supported in the work I do, but I know a large number of people I see working around the streets who are clearly past retirement age. Obviously, they're doing part-time work, which they can get in the gig economy now without getting their age being a barrier because they're not earning enough in their pensions or the superannuation to yeah. be able to survive. So it's again, it's not a positive thing. I think it's a sign of the weakness that people are feeling and the decline in wages that's been quite marked in the West for the last 30 years. And also, of course, the decline in retirement benefits because of the decline in those wages. And do you see the situation worsening in the future? I do. I think it's a large reason behind the Gilets Jaunes protests in, in France. And now that, that protest has been going on now for going on half a year. And uh, that is just people saying, we simply can't take another impost on a cost of living. We're rioting in response to that. So um, you don't see that sort of thing happening when people are content. Yeah, right.
Thank you so much for joining us and talking to uh, us about that. Uh, Zen, last comment from you. What do you think that young people should do in this regard when they're seeing so many, uh, such an abysmal situation out there? They're investing highly in university degrees. When they go out, they cannot find jobs. What would your advice be to them? I think I would uh, ask, them, ask them to focus on execution versus falling in love with the idea because most aspiring entrepreneurs get glossy-eyed and mesmerized with their own genius product and business ideas that they have. So I think it is more important to focus on execution than the idea. And the truth is that most ideas are not that unique. The difference mm -hmm. in those that become big successes is mostly people are taking action and getting it to the market. Yeah. And I think a good team can execute a mediocre idea and make it great and make it a great company. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, f uh, thank you for joining us, Zen, and talking to us about that. Uh, Mohammed, uh, building on to what just Zen said, what would your advice be to people who have mediocre ideas? Would you give them the same advice there and how to execute mediocre ideas? That, uh, that's a brilliant advice that uh, Mr. Zen gave. And whoever, whoever is listening to this, um, that is the way to go. Ideas are dime a dozen. Ideas are really not that important. You need an idea to execute on. So um, even the big, big companies, they were not first to market. They were not unique ideas in the sense that there was a social network before Facebook. You know, there was a car company before Toyota. There were, I mean, it, the examples are endless. So yeah. uh, having said, totally agreeing with the, what has been said, but also adding uh, what I have learned uh, walking the path that I've been walking for the last two decades, almost now, alhamdulillah, is that uh, learn sales, yeah. learn and marketing. And Mohammed, because since we're running uh, short on time, that's a great point there. And thank you so much for joining us. I'll end uh, with Usman here when he was saying learn sales, learn marketing. Mm -hmm. How important do you see that? It is actually the most important uh, part of any company. Um, you can, you need to dream, you need to dream big and you definitely need to execute the plans as well. And obviously, if you're not marketing it enough, you're not going to be standing at any point. Yeah. So it's actually important to market it at the best possible way. Yeah. And thank you so much, Usman, for that last comment. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all our guests for joining us. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again next week with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.